He used his hands to cut, bruise, and torment those he hated, and his tongue was almost as wounding. Some are meant to walk the earth like giants, believing the world is subject to their whims. And so it was for Jack Johnson, who married two white women and had the gall to expect white America to accept him on his terms. He was a black man who had it all. He was the trickle that would become a waterfall, a brazen pathfinder, his audacity displayed with a wide smile. Writer-historian Bert Sugar. When he was sitting in his corner, he would purposefully miss spitting into the spittoon and spit on the table with pinpoint accuracy of all the writers sitting there hitting their papers. He loved crossing the color line. He loved doing outrageous things. Jack Johnson loved to be Jack Johnson. It was the wrong time, but he didn't care. This was turn of the century America, when segregation had just been sanctioned by the Supreme Court, 50 years before the roar of Martin Luther King. Yet somehow here he was at center stage, intriguing and frightening. Historian Hank Kaplan. America has a long history in, in being bigoted against and prejudiced against the black men and um, becomes a great black athlete from Galveston, Texas. And Whitey just couldn't handle that. Just couldn't handle it. For years denied a title shot, Johnson humiliated champion Tommy Burns in 1908. Burt Sugar. Now we're back to that underlying question. It's all right to have a black champion as a middleweight, a welderweight, a lightweight, heavyweight champion. All of a sudden, Jack Johnson meant that the white man's burden had become the white man's master. The party began for the new champion, who traveled the world indulging himself, ensuring he would be more hated than loved. In 1910, former champion Jim Jeffries was lured out of retirement and installed as the Great White Hope. Inactive for six years, incredibly, Jeffries was favored by many. Writer, friend, Don Buchan. There's a story that uh, two blacks went into a cafe and one of them said, give me a cup of coffee with cream, weak and white, like Jeffries. The other said, give me a cup of coffee, black and strong like Jack Johnson. The result would unleash racial hatred. There were riots, killings. Suddenly, it was against federal law to ship fight films across state lines. The reverberations were long-lasting. Bert Sugar. Basically, Jack Johnson's fall from grace meant that for the next 20 years, blacks were, with rare exceptions, blackball, no pun intended prohibited, kept out of sports and boxing specifically. In 1913, Johnson fled the U.S. to escape jail. He was charged unfairly with interstate prostitution because of his travels with a white woman. Later, he lost his title in exile to Jess Willard. Suspicions remain about a fix. Don Buchan. Johnson was seven years in France with his appetite for sweets and French wines, and he was 37 years of age. He would have gotten the decision had it been 10 rounds or 12 or 15, but he just didn't have the gas to go any farther. 26 rounds. And the rock-hard Kansan giant, Jess Willard, got the title. In 1920, Johnson surrendered to federal lawmen, expecting leniency. Instead, he got a year at Leavenworth Penitentiary. Wealthy no more, he was still doing exhibitions at age 50. But I am here. I want to do something good. And out of doing that something good, something will come good to me. It was June 10, 1946. Not long after being refused service at a roadside cafe in North Carolina, Johnson lost control of his Lincoln Zephyr. The car was traveling at a high speed when it slammed into a power pole. He was 68 years old. As it happened, there was no second chapter in his life, just silence after the cheering had stopped. He managed to achieve greatness as a boxer, but it could be said he achieved something more as an American pioneer.